Good afternoon. I'm Robert Rivard, the editor of the San Antonio Report. Welcome to our third annual San Antonio Report Medical Forum, uh, the third one in four years after taking a hiatus through the pandemic last year. Um, this year we'll be get, doing a checkup again two years out on the San Antonio Partnership for Precision Therapeutics with our four leading institutions, UT Health San Antonio, the University of Texas at San Antonio, Texas Biomed Research Institute and the Southwest Research Institute. And we'll meet our distinguished panelists in just a minute. And we'll also welcome uh, Jenna Salcedo Herrera uh, from uh, Greater SATX um, to talk about the economic development impact of all of this. Well, let me start by thanking our sponsors. Uh, the series, uh, again, is free and open to the public. We hope you'll share today's conversation on Facebook. Uh, the report will uh, post the video on our website uh, later today. You can share a link to that. Uh, we'd like as many people as possible to participate in this critical conversation in our community. Um, thanks to our gold sponsor, the San Antonio Medical Foundation. They've been with us all through this series and our silver and bronze sponsors, the Texas Biomedical Research Institute, UT Health San Antonio, the University of Texas at San Antonio, the Texas Research and Technology Foundation, and University Health. <clears throat> and of course, if you find value in our reporting here at the report uh, and uh, our civic engagement events, which we hold regularly, and we soon hope to be doing that back in person, City Fest is coming up as a hybrid event, both in person and virtually. Uh, we hope you'll go to um, the link that we're posting here in the chat room and um, take the next step from being a reader and an attendee at our events to becoming a supporting member. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and we appreciate the support of every one of our members, uh, which allow uh, us to do the journalism we do and put on events like today. So let me introduce our panelists and we'll bring them on one by one. And then I'll um, pose a general question that gives each of them the opportunity to make some comments at the outset and we'll go from there uh, into a general conversation. Uh, welcome Dr. William Henrich, um, president of UT Health San Antonio. Good morning. Thanks, Bob. Good to be with you. And uh, Dr. Larry Schlesinger, uh, president and CEO of the Texas Biomedical Research Institute. Larry, good morning. Good morning, Bob. I guess we're afternoon now. We we signed on in the morning, but it's afternoon. That's right. Dr. Taylor Amy, president and of the University of Texas of San Antonio. Hey, Bob. Good afternoon. It's great to be here with you. Thank you, Taylor. Adam Hamilton, the CEO of Southwest Research Institute. Good morning, Adam. Hi. Hi, Bob. Good afternoon. Good to see you. And Jenna Salcedo Herrera, the president and CEO of Greater SA Texas, uh, SATX. Excuse me. Good afternoon, Jenna. Hi there. Happy to be here. So, Bill, let me start with you. And we've all agreed we'll go on first names to make this a little bit easier on the audience and the moderator. Uh, we are two years out from our last meeting. The pandemic interrupted uh, so much in the city and at each of uh, of the uh, institutions that that uh, that you uh, gentlemen lead. And um, I'm just wondering how we are at the two year mark for the San Antonio uh, Partnership for Precision Therapeutics as each of you have led and continue to lead your institutions out of the pandemic and continue the billion dollar collaborative that uh, was initiated uh, in 2018. You're on mute, Bill. Okay, Bob. There we go. Good. Um First of all, great to be here uh, with my colleagues and uh, appreciate the opportunity to have this forum again. Um, I think from our point of view, from uh, from my point of view, and I hope from my colleagues' point of view, the collaborative is healthy and thriving and uh, is even more necessary now. One element that the pandemic has brought to attention is the need for biomedical research to thrive and grow. You'll recall, I know you know this, Bob, but some of your listeners may not realize that the reason we started this collaborative is the four of us realized that San Antonio had these outstanding research organizations, which were already partnering, partnering together. But uh, we thought that by joining together under one banner, we could catalyze more research, more collaboration among ourselves and bring to attention the scientific hub uh, that San Antonio is. So between us, for our listeners to know, we have a billion dollars of research between us, or roughly that amount. 
And uh, by, uh, by furthering our collaborations, we wanted to provide a platform, a venue in which this could, this could go forward. To date, we funded between us seven different projects, which uh, my colleagues can comment upon, and it's strengthened the bonds between us. So from my point of view, the pandemic has by necessity highlighted the need for science in uh, our city, our region, our country, the world. And it's made uh, even more compelling that research collaborations like the one we formed here uh, uh, are up and running and uh, that they do well. The other thing I would say before closing is that our research efforts between the four of us are remarkably complementary. In other words, each of us brings different and vital research components to an area to allow it to be developed. And that's particularly evident to me in, in drug development, where the four of us collaborate on different elements of drug development that make us uh, have uh, all the componentry to make San Antonio a hub for this. So I think the, I think the pandemic has has basically by necessity proven to be a forward uh, catalyst for our collaboration. And from my point of view, our collaboration is thriving today. Thank you, Bill. And, and Larry, your, your organization has certainly been in the news quite a bit here and nationally uh, through the pandemic. So give us your perspective uh, from where we are today. Well, let me uh, start by building on a bill. First of all, Bob, thank you so much. SA Report has been an incredible supporter of SAPPD from its inception. And for that matter, um, Greater uh, SATX also has been. So I'm really appreciative of this collaborative effort. Um, I, I think the pandemic has emphasized what is a unique culture of the city. To have the four of our large research institutions uh, come together from leadership down to form this partnership itself is, I think, transformational. Um, science is moving very fast, and that's been very helpful in this pandemic. But it no longer happens siloed in individual laboratories. It actually works at the interface of scientific disciplines. By bringing these institutions together, I think we don't do incremental science. We make transformational change. So um, I, I think this partnership has been very successful and continues to be very successful. Bill talked about some of the outputs from it. Uh, and we have $30 million of submitted grants at the federal level, private level, uh, that are coming from uh, this uh, program and $10 million uh, in uh, funded grants that have come from this program in a very short period of time, despite only $1.4 million of investment. So clearly the return on investment has been enormous. But, you know, the title of SAPPD, as we talked about just a few moments ago, is rather technical for your audience. But here's the bottom line. The bottom line, and I think the pandemic, particularly with long COVID, has emphasized this. Despite the fact that we're almost genetically identical, we're actually, each one of us, very, very different. The way we respond to an infection is very different. The way we respond to a therapy is very different. At the core of this unique collaborative, we're interested not only in discovering new therapies, which are absolutely essential for COVID-19 and everything else, but the understanding that um, each of us will respond differently to that infection. And with the demographics of San Antonio, the tag the city of the future in terms of its demographics, racial and ethnic diversity, we need to appreciate that what we do matters differently to each individual. We need to handle things on a more, if you will, precision basis. So now by bringing the best minds together, uh, doing what is truly team science, I think we are really making a difference. Um, I'll conclude by saying, I think, um, you know, this has been a challenging time. Um, Texas Biomed established its mission and vision in 2018 as an institution to be a global leader in eradicating infectious diseases, um, timely. Uh, but it allowed us to begin to prepare ahead of the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, we moved in rather quickly. And a lot of this has been cataloged. But what I'll say is it's really accelerated an understanding of the kind of work we do on a national and international stage. Um, and I think that's very important for the city of San Antonio. Um, and I think it's also highlighted the fact that the work we do, which is really 
outstanding animal model work, predictive of human health and disease, is absolutely essential in developing any new therapies or vaccines going forward. That's been highlighted even by the director of the NIH, Francis Collins, recently detailed. Um, and I think that we have a very unique institution that's really making a difference. I'm very proud of all the work that's being done here. The science, uh, the talent is- I'm not sure we- uh... And so, um, I don't know, I just heard something, but the talent's exceptional. And uh, and that's, that's where I think I would end my opening comments. Thank you, Bob. Well, thank you, Larry. You said timely. I would I would say prescient. Um, the redefinition of your mission in 2018, when none of us knew what was about to happen. Uh, Taylor, you're certainly marching toward becoming a tier one research university at UTSA. So this must be a key uh, component of that. Well, you know, uh, it, it's a wonderful to have this reflective conversation but also a, a, a very proactive conversation about where this is all going. Uh, if you think about what's transpired over the last year and a half, our city, our community has been deeply impacted by this, this pandemic and this virus. Um, all four of our institutions had to pivot in profound ways. And one of the things that I think is remarkable, really remarkable about our partnership is this, Amidst all the things that we were all working on, we got together with a, an urgency about wanting to take the power of our partnership to address directly issues that were related to um, vaccine development, to antiviral therapies, for mining uh, databases about compounds that might have efficacy around, around being antiviral agents, around our efforts to develop uh, precision therapeutics, monoclonal Antibody, antibody kind of, 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 of therapeutics for, for the, the, this, this virus. And rather than, 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 than sit back and, and try to, to, to make it through the pandemic, we, we four were committed deeply to putting the, the partnership out there to respond immediately and proactively to, to our, our need nationally and, and here, here in our community. And so uh, it speaks to the nimbleness of our organizations. It speaks to our commitment about the power of this partnership. And it speaks to the fact that um, if you think about it, this pandemic actually aligns perfectly with the, the purpose of, a, of a, something like a partnership for precision therapeutics because of the role that infectious disease has in human response. It's very personalized, but it's also um, uh, an opportunity for, for us to show the power of science. When I first got here in 2017, I was deeply interested in wanting to partner with my, my, my colleagues on this panel because of the impact that, that all of this has. We, we are a science city and we haven't really finished figuring out how to tell that story nationally. And, uh, but it's also deeply tied to where we're going from an economic development perspective. So I was just deeply impressed by the fact that we all rallied to, to get in front of this pandemic as much as possible. And it speaks to the, the, the wonderful aspects of our, our partnership. So um, it, it's a special thing. Well, thank you, Taylor and, and Adam. Um, uh, there, there's certainly no shortage of extraordinary science going on out at your institution. And it's a story we try to tell, but I, I, I think I probably agree with Taylor. We don't tell it well enough. Well, thank you, Bob. It, and uh, it's good to be here with you and everybody else. You asked about the, uh, the impact of the pandemic on our activities and how it's touched our, our different organizations. And one thing I think is a little ironic is, is that the pandemic itself has enabled some of the success of the SAPPT. And that may sound odd, but you know, if you think back two and a half years ago or two years ago, we weren't that comfortable commuting, communicating in a virtual environment with WebEx and Zoom and all these other media and, and formats. And now uh, this has really taken away one of the, what could have been obstacles to really successful collaboration between our four organizations. Since we are not co-located, we would used to rely on the uh, scientists and engineers and even us as leaders on physical visits. You know, we'd have to set up time and, and drive to a different location and meet. And really now with the tools that we have and the habits we've developed in our business and professional lives, it's enabled us to meet more often, to have meetings that are more efficient because there's less travel time. And I think that's really been a, 
a big part of why we've been successful with the SAPPT is because we have this almost instantaneous and continuous communication between the collaborators at all the different organizations. So that's just um, the irony kind of strikes me as, as being funny or interesting there. Jenna, um, the combined science and medical research capacity of this collaborative, um, I've written before, may be the most underappreciated asset in the city. And I wonder, as you pivoted at Greater SATX from where you were to where you're going, how, um, how the work of these institutions and the caliber of the uh, research that they're doing factors into economic development, both in terms of conversations with companies thinking about coming here, but also the impact it might have on other, uh, you know, corporate entities in, in expanding here and remaining here. Yeah, well, Bob, first of all, it might be the understatement of the century when I say that I'm excited about this specific partnership because it is uniquely San Antonio. It is a uniquely San Antonian asset. And what I mean by that is it's timely for all of the reasons that my colleagues previously stated related to the pandemic and, and all of the complementary research being done across their, their respective institutions. But it's also timely for our community because we, as we've discussed multiple times, we're at an inflection point where we are not just celebrating our 300 years of history, but we're preparing for the future and how we position for success, not just today, but in years to come. And what they are doing together in partnership, you've heard the word partnership and collaboration multiple times this morning. This is differentiating us. It's of course going to help and protect us, but it's going to position us in the future. We are often referred to as uh, the home of military medicine. Well, we are now a destination for precision therapy. Uh, and Dr. Schlesinger, I think summed it up extremely well in explaining what the partnership does. But when I hear a billion dollars worth of collaborative research, to me, that says a billion dollars worth of alignment and these different institutions coming together to work together more so than they have ever done in the past. I hear a billion dollars of progress positioning this community. And again, a billion dollars of investment, not just in today, but in the future. And as you can imagine, that is a critical element of our regional economic development strategy. And we believe that this collaboration and this partnership will position us uh, for years to come. It's certainly already having an impact on the pipeline today. Well, we wanna hear more in the program, Jenna, about biosciences as a target industry to, to help grow our, our economy and job base. I, I wanna go back to the four of you though and ask uh, to follow up on Adam's remarks about how you know virtual conferencing and so forth is, has given us new tools. Of course, it also has its limits, which we're, we're all familiar with. As an outsider and a civilian, I would think that the work all that's happening at all four of your institutions, that it would be critical that it's in laboratories, that people are physically together, that they're running experimentation. I know a lot of it these days is on computers, not just test tubes, but how, how have you actually stayed productive and managed your workforce through the pandemic? Uh, that's obviously something that everybody's been challenged everywhere, but I would I would think when it comes to medical and science research, there's some unique aspects to that that you've had to uh, wrestle with. If, you, if you'll allow me uh, to make a comment about that. Thank you, Bob. Um, so how does science get done? Um, you know, science gets done because a group of scientists come together and ask questions that are of importance to, in this case, combating COVID-19. Um, and each person comes to the table with complementary expertise. And in answering this question, I, and I will get to the virtual uh, part of this, let me just give you one of the seven projects, give you an example, give your audience an example of this, the power of this collaborative in terms of how we communicate. So COVID-19 is a virus and that virus gets in our bodies. And you know that each of us respond quite differently to this virus, that's pretty obvious, right? Well, one of the ways in which the virus infects us is by having our bodies create an enzyme, a protein, that actually cleaves, cuts a part of the important part of the virus to make it more infectious. Well, you know, that enzyme, that protein, has mutations in it in each of us that make that enzyme more or less effective. Right away, that means 
that Bob's response to the virus could be different than Larry's because you may have a mutation and I don't, okay? So one has to study that mutation or the mutations to understand infectiousness of COVID-19. Well, it doesn't stop there. That would be one lab. But then you say, okay, now I've discovered that. What does that mean? How could I translate that into something meaning meaningful for all of us? Well, it turns out that our colleague at Swery has some incredible computational capabilities to allow us to design or make molecules that allows us to begin to think about those enzymes as targets for a therapy. So now we need to come together with those scientists to start thinking about how we can make new therapies. Okay, so now we make new therapies. We make compounds in a test tube. Oh, and what do you do next? Well, the, you have to test these compounds and you need model systems to test the compounds. So we start with animals, with test tubes, uh, tissue culture, animals. Well, so we have all of that within the partnership. So now we can actually test these new compounds and really begin to discover new therapies. And one of the projects is exactly that. It's focused on how to promote uh, new therapies for COVID-19 based on this enzyme. So think about how you do that. Well, we're in our laboratories doing research, but do you know that the scientists talk to each other almost daily by Zoom or some other platform because we have to share the information. If you don't share the information, the science isn't going to go anywhere. So actually, science is a collaborative effort by definition. And the reason we got to a vaccine in 11 months is that virtual platforms enabled the global community to talk on a daily basis. We were all talking daily to our colleagues around the world. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Tony Fauci's group at the NIH, the folks at Harvard, the folks at locally among our four organizations, all together trying to move science forward as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And, and that, that really is team science. So I would say to you that from the standpoint of communication, the virtual platforms have been transformational in themselves. It's just made it easier, like we're doing today in this hour, communicating more effectively by seeing each other, by being able to communicate and feel like we're in each other's room here. Having said that, the science, the hard science, the wet bench science still is done at the bench. And with regard to Texas Biomed anyway, we were deemed an essential institute during the pandemic. And the science continued, not easily, but it continued. While we had in place, and I think my partners uh, here also have this, a pandemic response team to continue to evaluate the safety, not only at Texas Biomed of our employees, but also our animals, which is our precious commodity. And the humane treatment of the animals becomes essential during the pandemic. And, and Taylor, you and, and, and Bill are both running and have been running institutions of higher education at the same time that necessarily had to shut down and go virtual. So. How did you balance virtual versus in-person and keep the research components at your respective institutions going? Truth of the matter is, Bob, uh, we were deemed essential as well. So we, throughout the pandemic, we kept our laboratory operations and our chemistry department, our molecular biology department, our engineering departments, we kept those up and running with very careful safety protocols in place. But our lab science continued throughout the pandemic. and. As, as, as folks were, were, were alluding, as, as Larry indicated, team science is inherently collaborative. We have all of our scientists, our faculty are wanting to collaborate here in, in town and across the, the U.S. and globally. And in, a, in, in some ways, one of the best things that came out of a very, very challenging pandemic was this acceleration of collaboration around team science. So in some ways, it, it, we weren't really impacted in the science discovery enterprise about about shutting down campuses or going virtual. It was something that could continue for us. And I, I believe my colleagues here would all say we were all operational in the same way under the same careful constructs throughout the pandemic, so. Uh, Bill, I think you're on mute, but let's unmute him. Yeah. There we go. I would add something uh, to what Larry and Taylor have said in saying that, you know, Bob, uh, our missions our four missions never changed with the pandemic, clinical care, education, biomedical research, and community service. But the way we executed the missions certainly changed. We had to pivot in the educational space to many more virtual sessions. 
and find a way to safely get our learners who learn at the bedside to the bedside without exposing them to uh, harm. Uh, on the clinical side, we had to take care of a onslaught of medical needs. First of all, the patients with COVID in our hospitals and our clinics was overwhelming and continues to be a major challenge. And in addition to that, we had to vaccinate uh, literally thousands and thousands of people. We gave 180,000 doses of the vaccine at our institution to our community. Uh, on the research side, I would say this in support of what Taylor and Larry have said, is we never stopped. We kept the buildings open, kept the research project going. The investigators remained productive and collaborative throughout the whole thing. On the community service side, we've been at the forefront of providing advice to the city and county in the public health space to make certain that we got correct information into the public domain so that people could do the right thing or as close to the right thing as recommended by experts in dealing with the pandemic. So the mission that stayed on track, Bob, really stayed glued to its original uh, uh, goal was the research mission never shut down. Thank goodness it didn't shut down because people could go to their labs safely. They could develop ideas safely. They could collaborate in virtual spaces like this safely. And science, thank goodness, science has marched forward. Adam? Uh, yeah, it's great comments by uh, all of my, my colleagues. Um, like them, we were also deemed an essential business. And I think that's important because the research portfolio at the Institute is very broad. And it's not just focused on the biomedical and health aspects of applied research, but we are an applied research organization. And by its very definition, what that means is that we have to be doing our experiments and our laboratory work in facilities that are equipped for those kinds of operations. So uh, a great fraction of our staff continued working throughout the pandemic, but what we had to do then was to modify the potential interactions between staff by varying shifts and by putting up barriers and changing protocols and procedures, requiring masks, having sanitation available, and eventually on to, uh, to being able to vaccinate our staff here at our medical clinic. So it did affect our, our operations, but um, you know, by our very nature, most of our staff are problem solvers and they are committed to their profession. And what we saw was that they came up with different ways to overcome the obstacles presented to them by COVID-19 and the pandemic. And by and large, um, I wouldn't, we did skip a few beats, but all, of, all in, we really continued to contribute to our mission and work in all the, uh, the different areas that we support from emissions reductions to robotics, to uh, pharmaceuticals and health, uh, space science. In fact, we have a space mission launching in two weeks that had to be really developed and satellite spacecraft built during the pandemic time. So we had to keep working. I think for the four of us, um, of all the people in our organizations, our roles probably changed the most. I know I never thought I would be picking up fresh produce and toilet paper from our supplier here at the Inst Southwest Research Institute and taking it over to Texas Biomed so that uh, their staff didn't have to worry about providing fresh produce for their own families when it was hard to find. You know, they could continue working on solutions for the pandemic. Um, that's the kind of thing you just don't expect, but you have to adjust and perform to in these extreme conditions. Uh, your delivery of toilet paper to Larry went on un, unreported uh, on our site. We missed <laughs> that uh, in the course of the pandemic. I, I want to go back. I, and I, you know, it is it is uh, uh, the generosity by Adam and, and his team uh, uh, unbelievable. I am so appreciative of uh, the partnership that had extended beyond the science to helping each other and helping each other's employees. Um, you know, again, that's the secret sauce that Jenna talked about. It's part of the culture of the community and the desire to be better. Well, I want to go to Jenna now. In a few minutes, I want to go back to the four of you and recollect the fact that you self-seeded this project, each with a financial contribution. And I'm wondering how that has developed over two years and whether that has, um, uh, in fact, uh, in, uh, 
you know, accelerated uh, research or whether you're limited by your resources. But Jenna, first to you, this is very technical work people are doing. How do you, how do you translate that technical work, that research into a elevator pitch, as it were, to go out and try to identify specific um, targets, I suppose you would call in the biosciences and other states and cities and make the argument that uh, collaborative efforts are underway here that could enhance their own work if they would come here. Yeah, so I think we we attack it in two different ways. I would say there's upstream alignment and then downstream as it relates to specific projects and or deals, right? Um, but upstream, I think what we're talking about today and specifically this partnership is informing that narrative, right? Even as it relates to trying to get hyper-focused on where we can compete and win, which was what our regional economic development strategy was all about. What are those target industries where we can get laser focus, we can get in the game and we can win, right? Where are we positioned to differentiate ourselves? So upstream, these folks on, on the Zoom today were informing that strategy. And there is a unique opportunity here where there's alignment between the military, between uh, commercial operations and between academia. And these four institutions are bringing that together better than they ever have. But at the very beginning of this conversation, we talked about needing to tell our story better. And so now that we have the, the verbiage, now that we know where we're going to target upstream, downstream, it makes it easier because we know what types of organizations we're targeting. We know in what geographies they are. And then when they become real projects, well, I do less of the selling and I can put somebody like Taylor Amy or uh, Dr. Schlesinger in front of these folks that can really speak the language. So it has been extremely helpful that they've joined this, this collaborative effort. And it, as I mentioned, it, it's supportive of our overall effort strategically upstream and then also operationally downstream. So can we scale up the operation? Is that a challenge or an issue? Or are you doing as much as you possibly can in terms of capacity? I know this started out as self-funding. I don't know if there's been federal, state or local funding, uh, particularly in the realm of all of the stimulus spending that's going on. Uh, across the country. What's the financial uh, picture of this collaborative and, and where you'd like to see it go? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tackle this initially, but my colleagues will also have good thoughts to share. When we, we got together, we had some founding principles uh, that we wanted to um, emphasize. And, and one of them was that we wanted to equally invest in this. So all four institutions have been making annual contributions uh, on the order of, if my memory serves me, 200K a year from our each of our own discretionary R&D accounts to put into the pot to fund very carefully selected and curated research projects. But we also had an eye from the very beginning that we wanted to amplify our own internal investments into these projects. You heard some data shared earlier by Bill that since we've begun, we've funded uh, seven projects and they've gone forward and that's produced some, some derivative benefit that we were intentional about. And we've been going after federal funding opportunities and we have to date four new grants that have been funded, um, most from the National Institute of Health, but that's what we exactly wanted. We wanted this partnership to go forward to, to seed ideas, seed good, good projects, get those projects up and running, produce pilot data, and then go after large federal opportunities. So that's already happening with a marvelous return on investment. But I'd like to, to give a shout out to Jenna in particular here, because uh, when the pandemic started last year, she was in connection with a, a group of philanthropists here in San Antonio that were interested in investing in important things that would make a difference relative to the pandemic. And you may have heard that last year we got a million dollar gift, the partnership got a million dollar gift from USAA to advance our work around vaccine development and antivirals development and uh, that million dollar uh, investment that came in to our partnership through Texas Biomed uh, was actually initially brokered by Jenna advocating for what we were doing as a science collaborative. And uh, so those kinds of things are, are all deeply uh, sort of uh, synergistic with each other. The, the fact that our communities investing in us is important. The fact that uh, we're getting federal agencies interested in supporting the research that's coming out of our, 
our partnership is all part of the grand scheme that we have about scaling up. And uh, we're gonna scale this up a number of ways. It's, um, we can chat about that, but one of the principal ways right now is to go after federal funding opportunities because of the uniqueness of what we do here, the strengths of our, our four programs, and the fact that we already have had deep collaboration prior to formally establishing the partnership, but even more so now. So all of this is happening as planned and strategized and uh, it, it's going in the right direction. So we believe it's intentionally going to scale because that's where we want it to go. I hadn't, I hadn't thought, Taylor, about the role of uh, philanthropic dollars in, the, in this initiative, but uh, that may be something that, that all four of your institutions are pursuing. Would uh, any of the other um, panelists want well, to talk about that? I'll, I'll make a couple of comments, additions, Bob, and I see Bill raising here. We'll all contribute to that. I do want to uh, shout out, in addition to the generous gift by USA, the San Antonio Aereo Foundation has also leaned in with a a contribution to Texas by uh, sorry to uh, SAPPT that uh, money uh, comes in as, in the collaborative through Texas Biomed, but it's for the purpose of SAPPT. But let me just comment on a couple of other things. In addition to all the funding, which is the obvious financial return on investment, which uh, Taylor emphasized, um, the collaborative itself has published ten papers, including in the most competitive journals in the world. Those all get then out on social media and increase the brand of the program and the collaborative. Um, there are have been 11 speaking engagements as a result of the seven projects that have been funded, including three national, international, and five national speaking engagements by investigators coming from the collaborative. From the collaborative. So um, there is a downstream win because science requires a reputational score that enables us to effectively compete in a hyper-competitive environment in research uh, to get those federal dollars, not only from the NIH, but from the Department of Defense, other federal agencies, as well as foundations like Bill and Melinda Gates. So um, I think that um, those are also very, very important to bring out uh, in terms of our progress going forward. That was a few things I wanted to mention, but Bill, I think, wanted to say a couple of words. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Larry. Um, a couple of comments. It's hard to capture in just a few minutes the unique nature of this collaborative for an audience that's not as familiar with the back and forth that occurs in science. Most of the time in large cities where there are multiple research institutions, there are, there are one-off collaborations which occur, but not the complementary collaborations that we have here. I can say from my own point of view, our collaboration has been organic. It's been based on our personal friendship, our personal commitment to trying to bring attention to a city that doesn't get sufficient attention for its science expertise. And born out of that has been uh, this effort. So, so the fact that it's organic, Bob, and not top down and not somebody who said, go fund this, the fact that it's really born out of our personal respect and uh, complementary aspects of our organization. We're not competing with each other here. None, there's none of this is, that's competitive. We, we celebrate each other's successes completely and wholly. Uh, secondly, I would say this, the fact that this $1 million, which is a puny amount of money in the grand scheme of things, has resulted in $10 million of new money coming to San Antonio and has resulted in $30 million of grants being submitted is sensational. Your, your listeners might not realize that for every federal dollar we bring to this city, there's a multiplier effect of five to $7 of economic growth. So this, this uh, $10 million means that it's like having a 50 or $70 million halo effect, collateral effect that goes to the city. Now I'm speaking only about the economic part of it here. The scientific part of it is that, is that success breeds success. The more than what Larry said about the, the scientific journal publications, the more elevated our investigators become because of their collaboration that brings more success more people want to participate more people will want to support us at least that's our our hope 
both locally and nationally. And the fact that we have an actual, true, authentic collaboration is appealing to study sections that look at our grants because we have a track record now that makes us even more appealing to them. So uh, those are my points about this. Success breeds success. The economic benefit, the wind under the wings of the city in its scientific enterprise is uh, a lift that I think will be, be felt for a long time to come. And I know uh, the four of us are committed to keep it going as we seek others to join us, to hold our, to, to link up arm in arm with us, to help us uh, advance this cause. So it's an exciting time for us. And uh, I'm thrilled by the success we've had so far. Well, Jenna, I know that, um, I don't know what the latest numbers are, but going beyond the, the, the actual precision therapy partnership, this is really the smart jobs economy leading edge in our city. It must be, we're either at or over 100,000 smart jobs out in the medical and biosciences community. And, and uh, that's all talent and um, a, a very significant sector when you sort of present the San Antonio economic pie to people here or, or outside. It is. And I just have to say amen to everything that Bill just said. That's why I was I wanted to, to chime in and say, look, this this partnership, obviously, there's a lot of work being done. And there was some seed investment from each of these four leaders who are driving uh, just transformational change and progress and improvement in our community. But it's about growing the ecosystem and it's about a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. So what they're doing today is going to position us for even more R&D, even more corporations uh, and bioscience here in San Antonio that will invest again in, in this self-sustaining model that is the partnership for precision therapy. So I'm so excited about everything that, that you just referenced. And again, amen and shout out to all of that. Uh, but you're right, uh, Bob, it's about 160,000. So most most folks don't realize how large healthcare and biosciences is in San Antonio. And it's about one in five San Antonians employed uh, in this industry. And if you look at even our economic performance during the pandemic, uh, BLS put out some stats a couple of weeks ago and San Antonio ranked fourth in the nation for retained jobs during 2020. That's a big deal. Um, and of course, you point back if you disaggregate the data, just point back to healthcare and bioscience and that foundational industry in our community. So it has been foundational. It has been tied to the military for, for decades. But what's most uh, exciting is what's to come based off of this partnership and the research being done today. Again, I'll say this time and time again, but it's about the work being done today to position us for the future. And, and this is just the start. Go ahead. Bob, yeah, thank you, Jenna, for that too. I just wanted to add one thing on this general topic of discussion is that um, Bill, Taylor, Larry, and myself, we we might have started this initiative, but you know, really, I think the success of the projects and the programs uh, has really come from that next layer in our organizations. Each of us have appointed persons that are our technical representatives in the collaboration. And they all knew each other beforehand, but the fact that we've enabled them, we've allowed them and encouraged them to work together to build that network, uh, that has really produced great results because now these people are inseparable. We couldn't stop this now if we wanted to because they're working together, they're collaborating, they see the benefit and value in each of the four organizations and are building teams that I believe are competitive with any other teams in the world in the areas that we're focused on. So my hats are off to those technical representatives from our four organizations that have really built this network and uh, solidified the, the future of the, the partnership. You know, uh, Bob, it's worth noting this as well. Um, you can go to places, the Bay Area, Research Triangle, Boston in particular, New York, and find wonderful institutions that do cutting edge research that are very large and prominent. And, uh, but, but what's interesting about what we have to offer here in San Antonio from a densification of the knowledge enterprise, the, you know, Larry pointed this out that, that success att attracts positive outcomes and success. And what we're in the business of is densifying our knowledge enterprise around precision therapeutics here in San Antonio. 
because if you have a high density of talent here, it attracts all sorts of really wonderful things. And what we have here that's unique that you don't find in all these other cities that I just mentioned is this. We have one of the larger federally funded R&D centers at Southwest Research Institute in the United States. And we have, with Texas Biomed, we have one of these very, very unique, uh, uh, you know, biosafety level four facilities with a unique uh, combination of primates that allows for very specific testing that you don't find in any of these other cities. Uh, Larry may need to correct me slightly, but in some ways we are differentiated here in San, in San Antonio in a, a way that, that Houston or Dallas or Boston or San Francisco or, or New York will never be because of the things we already have in our portfolio here. So what we do with this and how we push this and how we tell the story going forward and how we tie it to economic development will be essential. But there are some things here that are disruptively unique that we need to take full advantage of. I think the four of you are unique in that equation as well and your leadership and coming together and leaning in to make it more about the community and positioning us as opposed to just your own respective institutions. That is what I believe our secret sauce is in San Antonio, that collaborative spirit. And so we, I am so grateful and, and I know we as a community are, are humbled by your leadership. Well, thank you, Jen. I, I need to add a couple of points to that. Um, one is, uh, Taylor's right, uh, the combination of resources and talent at Texas Biomed do not exist elsewhere. And what's really a key thing that I bring up every time is we have a community that supports us for the kind of research we do. And that is extraordinarily unique uh, in terms of think about putting our organization in another city. It would never happen in Boston or San Francisco or New York or it, it's uh, only here. The, and and we're doing it safely. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I, I want to emphasize that the leadership at the Institute has 150 years of experience in biocontainment research. I need to mention this because of all the news out of Wuhan. But I, but I want to mention uh, one additional point. Uh, I loved what Bill said, uh, but I want to add one more. What is another downstream benefit of the collaborative? Recruiting talent to the city. All of us have stories to tell about outstanding talent that we're recruiting more and more competitively from coast to coast. And the way you compete in science is you build reputation by the collaboration we're talking about today, the density that, that Taylor talks about. It is making it easier for us to have talent understand the benefit of moving moving to San Antonio. And I think the growth and reputation of the city is certainly built upon the talent we have here, but we are continuing to bring talent to the city. And for me and the magazine that Genesis Group supported, this kind of stuff is critical to bring the talent in. And I'll tell you what, we should have a gathering of some of the talent we've brought and have them give testimonials as to why they've come to the city. And I think you'd find that they understand the secret sauce as well as we do. I think those are stories actually that should be told, Larry. We're all familiar with your four institutions and we're familiar obviously with the leadership. And the pandemic actually gave us the opportunity, Bill, to meet some of the physician leaders, the research leaders, the PhD leaders who have come out onto a public stage to talk about vaccination and public health protocols. But by and large, this extraordinary talent base that you're talking about and that Jenna says we're successfully retaining, we don't know them. And too often we don't hear their stories and they are a brain trust. And a lot of us probably think, uh, no offense to, to San Antonio, that you would constantly be defending that talent against John Hopkins, against the Texas Triangle, against the Silicon Valley, against Harvard, MIT, et cetera. But you're making the argument instead that you're um, succeeding not only in retaining talent, but in attracting it. I predict some where I work features in the SA report for the four respective institutions here. <laughs> it's a cool feature. And, uh, you know, we're really showing people that there's a lot of unique people doing unique jobs in our city. And I would welcome uh, I would welcome any submissions, of course. But, uh, Bill, you were going to comment on. I was going to just comment on, yeah, on what you said, Bob, because and what, what I agree with what everybody's saying and what what Larry the point Larry made, 
but your listeners and the people on this call might be interested to know, people don't move cities. People in the science space don't move to another city for a higher salary. They don't move because they're trying to put more money in their own pocket. So their W-2 is bigger. They move because they see opportunity where they would go that allows them to advance the mission of their lives, which in some cases is uh, thwarting this virus or is curing cancer or, or curing Alzheimer's disease or doing something that advances the public good and the public health. And to provide the environment that is welcome to those kinds of talented people, a, collabor a collaboration like we have here is essential. They can look at UT Health and say, well, that's a pretty formidable institution, but where they are is formidable. And the place that they, the cities where they are existing, those are, they're good for a reason. And they've been good for a long time. They're venerable. But to have the capabilities of Texas Biomed, of SWERI, of UTSA at your fingertips when you relocate means that you can accelerate the progress that you want to make in your life's work more rapidly. And that is a that is a important an important selling point to people whose life work is to cure one of these diseases, is to make a major leap forward in one of these major areas. Science is really hard. Progress in science is so hard. And you've got a limited time when you can do it and having the collaborative talents of these institutions, which are so complimentary, helping you is uh, wind in your sails. So uh, uh, it, what Larry said is absolutely true. Uh, it helps us. And at some point, uh, with Jenna's help and with your help, Bob, uh, I think bringing some of these individuals who have come here because they've seen this opportunity uh, to San Antonio is something that we should we should promulgate. We should promote it because it, it again, success will lead to more success down the road. See another program taking shape on the horizon here, particularly when we get to the period where we can all take our masks and put them away for a while and, and reconvene together. I would love to get some of these individuals or their teams, however you want to posit it, um, to get together to talk about some of the kinds of projects that, that uh, Larry was talking about earlier and the papers that they've generated and the additional funding they've generated and so forth, because ultimately people are going to want to know how is this moving the needle, whether it's in infectious diseases or uh, cancer therapies or how, where can where can we cite concrete examples of where we're now treating people individually with greater efficacy because of this kind of research? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Bob, can I have one thing to what uh, what, what Bill just talked about? Um, the other kind of unknown benefit, I think, of, of the the great relationships that we have is that when we're recruiting talent, that talent often has significant other a spouse, partner, whatever it happens to be. And they are often the people that are involved in research activities, but maybe not particularly in the same field. And what we also do is uh, we try to help each other recruit by seeing if we can also place their partner, spouse, in other organizations in the partnership. So it's a fantastic tool for enhancing the attractiveness of San Antonio by by having those kind of opportunities presented to the spouses of persons that we're trying to recruit. Good morning. We are approaching the 1255 mark, which means I'm going to give each of you a, a minute or two to make some, uh, you know, closing remarks. And and we did talk about what a wonderful uh, thing it would be now to to go forward and, and meet some of the people that are on your teams. But uh, just looking ahead to the next year, and I know we're not out of the pandemic yet, I'd like each of you to comment on where you think the partnership is going forward in the near term. And, and uh, Bill, we'll start with you again. Thank you again. And thank you again, Bob, uh, Jenna, and my colleagues, and to our sponsors for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, uh, we're committed, I'm committed to investing additional treasure into the partnership to uh, continue to 
uh, provide these grants to individuals who have research that touches our four organizations. I'm also committed to advancing our collaborative efforts to raise the profile of the partnership nationally and internationally and to partner with organizations in the civic sector like the city and the county and uh, other organizations to, to advance this. I think the track record of having a almost 10 to one ROI on uh, grants that have come to our place is something that we need to promote. And I also think what you said at the last in your last segment, Bob, about showing the public what our research opens up as possibilities for therapeutics and for tangibles that can be delivered to uh, humans at large is something that we should support. But in short, I'm excited and thrilled to still be uh, on the team here and uh, looking forward to continued for forward steps for us. Thank you, Bill. Larry. Well, again, uh, like Bill, I want to thank you, Bob, for this hour. It's been fantastic. And I always like spending time with my colleagues. And uh, Jenna is always terrific and has been terrific for Texas Biomed. Thank her for all her continuing work. Um, you know, I, I, I think the SAPPT uh, that you see here today is clearly a model of biomedical research for the future. Uh, technology and science is moving um, at warp speed. Um, questions need to be addressed in multiple different ways. Single labs can't do this anymore. Um, it requires uh, team science and collaboration to really make a difference and to get us to better cures for a number of diseases. So, um, I, you know, I think the collaborative is going to continue to be strong. The leadership is invested. Uh, we're invested in all of this um, science and uh, love the community. But in the final minute, I'd be remiss with your audience if I didn't tell you, if I didn't say we're not out of this pandemic yet, and uh, and we have a lot more we need to do. Um, uh, I know at Texas Biomed, we now have 47 COVID-19 projects going on. You know, there is no other disease of humans that can affect each and every person on the planet uh, like a pandemic can. Um, and, you know, this has been true throughout history. Um, and vaccines have cured hundreds of millions of people throughout history. Uh, the fact that we have a vaccine and we'll have more vaccines uh, is to me still astonishing. Science, the hero. I just wanted to say to your audience, uh, vaccinate because we do want to get past this pandemic and continue this collaborative on a number of chronic diseases that we face going forward, not just COVID-19. Um, and, um, and vaccination is our way out. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. And That's I'm it. happy to talk with anyone who still has hes hesitancy about the safety and efficacy record of the vaccine. Get the jab, as our British friends say. To Hiller? You know, um, uh, I agree always with everything my colleagues say, because they're wonderful. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have this forum to talk with our community. I appreciate everybody that's attending and listening and learning. We're glad to follow up in any way that we can. What I want to remind myself and all of us is that <clears throat> uh, in some ways the partnership is a, is a startup and we are all angel investors in this and we are looking for a, a, a not a payout exactly or a merger and acquisition at some point. It's we are looking for the this densification thing I discussed earlier. We're looking to create such a prominent space scientific thought space here in San Antonio that that the ROI goes from 10 to 100. Uh, and and we're, we're a few years away from that. And we all have determination about continuing to invest and do this. And it's just going to need our careful uh, stewardship going forward to, to grow this enterprise and scale it. And and I'm just committing to, to our institution's belief in this going forward. And I know my colleagues all would say the same thing. It's going to be exciting to watch, Adam. Yes, I, I would just like to say thank you, Bob and uh, Jenna, and uh, thank you to my four colleagues. It, it's truly a pleasure to be in a city that has a culture like we enjoy here where we collaborate. And as Bill mentioned, we really do celebrate each other's victories and we, uh, we enjoy time with each other. Our staff like working with each other. And uh, just this environment really enables the kinds of future that we envision for 
the uh, PPT. Jenna, I'm giving you the last word. Whoops, you're on mute. It was very insightful while I was on mute. Um, I just want to say, Bob, and, and all the sponsors, thank you for allowing us this platform to have this conversation and for doing what you do daily to help us tell the San Antonio story. Just one call to action for the group. We put the uh, publication, the SAPPT publication, in the link for comments. Please help us tell the story. Um, this is an exciting time for San Antonio, even more so for biosciences, and it is working. We've seen an uptick in, in projects, about 10% of the pipeline. Um, significant job growth expected in the next five years, but we've got to continue to tell the story and it starts with our local San Antonians doing so. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you indeed to our sponsors, but a special thanks really for the, the five of you because this is very exciting and I can see really meaningful programming as far as the horizon stretches here and it'll be um, wonderful to watch things develop as they go. Uh, to our audience, I'd like to say a few things. Um, We've heard leadership and startup in the last few comments. Uh, we're almost 10 years old here at the report, but we still regard ourselves as a startup. Uh, very proud of the fact as we uh, conclude our first decade that new leadership is really um, taking over here. Um, we've now for almost a year had Angie Mock as our new publisher and CEO. Uh, she's making a huge difference after leaving the Boys and Girls Club of San Antonio to come here. And we really have a next generation uh, news uh, editor coming in, editor-in-chief and Lee Munsell from CNN.com, uh, a real leader in the digital news space. And um, you've all been so generous with your support uh, for me and our team here over the first 10 years of our operations. And I am asking for you to continue that support and even accelerate it for the next generation of, of leaders that will take over the report. So um, join us for City Fest, October 13th to 16th. Uh, there's a gala luncheon where we'll have Char Miller and Henry Cisneros on stage looking at the new book, West Side Rising. All the rest of the programming will be virtual uh, and free and open to the public. We're going to gather at Legacy Park Friday night for an evening of poetry and uh, art. And Saturday morning, we'll be riding bikes uh, down the San Antonio River and the West Side Creek system. That should be great. So this will be our fourth annual City Fest, and we look forward to seeing you then. Other than that, thank you again to the panelists, to our sponsors. I'm Robert Rivard, the editor, and thank you for being with us today.